All right, so like you said, uh, I'm David Dorsey. I work at Click Security doing R&D. I've been on the defensive side for the last 10 years, file analysis, RE, a little bit of IR. Recently doing some stuff with machine learning if you were over at uh, B-Sides. But we're here to talk about ROP. And um, so quick level setting, um, ROP is a technique to bypass non-executable memory, you bounce around memory, uh, executing small gadgets, typically end with the return instruction, hence the return and return oriented programming. Um, I use PIN to do this, um, it's a dynam dynamic binary instrument instrumentation framework from Intel, it's really nice. You don't need to recompile source code and it can instrument dynam dynamically generated code. Um, gives you lots of different granularity on the where you can instrument um, every, by instruction, basic block, function, DLL loads, unloads. You can do way more than what I'm using it for but it's, it's, it's a really cool tool. So the basic idea here is we're going to enforce some control flow integrity. Um, we're starting with just coarse grain controls. Um, so the idea is we know where your calls and returns are supposed to go you know, the functions, instructions after call instructions, things like that. Um, so we want to create a whitelist of these addresses. And then we want to store the offset to these because DLLs are loaded, you know, ALSR exists now. Um, and then if an indirect call or a return goes to, doesn't go to one of these addresses, then we go, hey, this is a ROP. So first we have to get those offsets. We have to build our whitelist. So how do we get those? So the first thing I did is I built a pin tool to give me those addresses. Um, so when DLL is loaded, it uh, iterates through all the exported functions, analyzes them, finds the calls. If it's a direct call, we put the target of that on the whitelist and then the instruction afterwards. If it's an indirect call, just the instruction afterwards because we don't know where it goes yet. Um, then in addition to that, all calls and returns are instrumented on the instruction level. And this is because when you run a program, not every function is in one of those exported ones. There's a whole lot more and so we need to get access to those. Then these offsets are stored at the, uh, at when the program ends, it's dumped to a text file. There's uh, some post processing that goes on afterwards to add them to the whitelist and make sure that you don't have any duplicates. So this is really good in the sense that we get real actual used values. There's no question, there's no heuristics we have to worry about. Bad news is it's not the fastest thing. Um, and we only get values that are actually run. So if a DLL isn't loaded, you're not getting code for that. And you also probably need to run it multiple times just to be safe. I would have to run three, four times to make sure every different code path was executed. <coughs> and then, excuse me. And then, so I decided that wasn't a good idea. I didn't want to do that. So I turned to Paiu. Um, it's much better at detecting these functions, much better. Um, you can extract the flow graphs and then you can bulk run them. Um, I actually had to create a patch for PiU that I'll, I'm making available. At some point it will be put into the main trunk but I have to fix it first. Um, but it's, it's much better. It, I get a lot more details or a lot more information quicker. So now that we have the data, what do we do with it? So I store all of them by uh, per DLL and I store them by the MD5 hash. And this is because DLLs can have different versions and I need to be able to account for that. So now that we have all this, let's detect the ROP. So we have another pin tool. When a DLL is loaded, pin gives you the address of that uh, or the location of that DLL on disk. So I take that location, lo open up the file, I hash it and then take that hash and then load the whitelist for that. And then I instrument all indirect calls and returns and if you're not on the whitelist, you're a ROP. So examples. So Adobe 9.3, Windows XP, there's the hash. This is an old exploit obviously. Um, so we run it, wave our hands and voila, we have a detection. Um, so we can see the address where we're coming from and where we're going to and then in the parentheses there is the offset. So yay, we found one. That's really good. I was really happy. But we only detected one. And that was disappointing. All you need to do is detect one. But, you know, I, I always want more. So let's take a look at what happened. So this is uh, in cool type DLL. Um, the attacker already has control of EAX. 
this is the beginning of the ROP chain. So the, the call executes and we jump here. And um, actually we don't detect this one at the moment. Um, there's a call before it so th this address is actually on the whitelist at the moment. So that's disappointing so okay that's why we didn't detect this one. We execute those three instructions and we get to this. So we do a stack pivot and this is one of, this is the one we detect. So like okay great we detected this now let's see why. So let's look at the instruction before it. Well there actually isn't really an instruction before it because it's not really a instruction that's supposed to be there. We just we're returning into the middle of an instruction and we can detect that. So at this point this is where it dies at this return right here and that's because a pin is affecting my memory layout. It's messing up the heap spray. Um, so when the return happens we're going to a random spot in memory which is generally not useful when you're uh, trying to execute a program or anything. So on a side note I don't know if we should run everything in pin because hey I prevented it from happening. So let's make believe here. How, do, how would we have done if this had actually uh, executed completely? So there's 45 chains in this ROP sequence, only 14 unique addresses. Not terribly surprising once you have a gadget that works, no sense finding another one that does the same thing. Um, two of these uh, were indirect calls and we had 43 returns. Um, three of the 14 addresses were on the whitelist so we had a pretty good detection rate there and overall of the, all the chains we only missed three of them. So not too shabby there. Um, example two here, Adobe 9.5, also on Windows XP, more recent um, vulnerability from late last year. And then this one, unfortunately I didn't get anything. Pin was messing up the memory layout again despite my best efforts. So we have to, again unfortunately we have to go to the make believe. Um, so this one actually had a huge ROP sequence. It's 208 but it was dominated by a NOP sled essentially. It was returning to itself over and over again and it, once it finished that then it went around about its business. Fifteen unique addresses this time, all of them returns. Um, again three, only three were on the white list and uh, of all the chains we detect 204 out of the 208. So we seem to have a, on the address part about the same detection rate. So let's do a little math. How good would this work if we could get it to work in, in pin? Um, so you can see you know the, the math works out in your favor pretty quickly. Um, even at 10 you th there's, there's a lot of nines in that detection uh, probability. That's a good thing. And so let's say this, this might be a little optimistic we'll say. So what if we drop it to 50 percent? Even at 10 addresses you still have 99.9 .9 percent. That, that was pretty, I was happy with that. Um, so let's talk about the limitations of this. Um, obviously breaking on the stack pivot, that's a pretty big limitation unfortunately. It, since we're running this in pin, it's also kind of slow. It's, it, this is not ready for prime time. I, I don't want to make you think that it is. Um, we don't handle uh, jump oriented programming, job. Um, I would need a sample to test that out first. And uh, we only do the coarse grain cor uh, control flow integrity, not the fine grain yet. So what's, what's left to do? Um, so obviously I, we have to, I still have to figure out the heat problem. Um, there's probably much better smarter instrumentations I can do. Um, maybe do things at the basic block level rather than every single instruction. I can push the analysis to another thread. Uh, the analysis doesn't take a long time but microseconds add up when you do it billions of times. Um, I, I want to add checks for JOP in there since I think we can do that. I'd love to implement this on OS X and Linux. That should be fine. Also on uh, Wednesday at Black Hat there was a really good talk about uh, bypassing all the ROP stuff. Um, Beast is in your memory. Um, I want to talk about that for a little bit here. Um, they defeated all, essentially all the coarse grain CFIs. Um, they had a sample, um, a demo where they defeated uh, Emmet, the latest one. It would defeat my current implementation, um, defeated uh, return frequency and sequence length heuristics from K Bouncer and Ropecker. So it's, that's the state of the art now. Um, so they raised the bar, so how can we defeat them now? That's the big question. So we can start to implement fine grain controls. Um, as I stated earlier, we currently wouldn't detect this particular uh, um, call into this location. However, 
really the only address, the only place where you should return to this specific, specific address, the CB38, is from that call. So if we're not coming from the return in that call, then that's very suspicious. So we should be able to do that. When we uh, pull all the uh, addresses er in the, uh, with PIU, we, sh we can easily get the return addresses from where they go. And so, and since we do all this, you know, pre-processing, um, this shouldn't add a lot of analysis time. And I think, you know, I we should be able to detect, we should be able to defeat what they currently have at the moment. So it's just, you know, raising the bar and then their turn to raise the bar. So there's probably a smarter ways to do this. Maybe want to do this in a debugger, um, detours. Um, K Bouncer in particular, I know, use, checks the um, MSRs for the last branch and that's how they can get their performance. Um, like I said, PIN is, is pretty slow. It's nice, but it's slow. It's good for using, uh, for proofing out a concept, um, but it's not going to be a prime time tool at this point. Um, and so that's about it. I have code for you. Um, it's not up yet. It should be, I'd like to say tonight, but let's be honest, it'll be more like tomorrow morning. Um, if you want to contact me, you can. Um, there's further reading. I know probably, uh, you might be able to read it if you're in the front, but if you want the slides later, there's some good uh, links there about other things about Rob. And that's it. Any questions? can't see a thing. All right. I got five. Yeah, I got a ton of time, so I can go back. Yeah, I know, I, was, I talked fast, I apologize. So one thing to note here, um, the ICU CNV36, that's used a lot because it's not ALSR'd, so in nine, in the 9.x series. So in most of your attacks against Adobe 9x, you'll, they'll use this. Um, let's see what else. That's about it really. The other ones, there were some calls that I could detect. Um, indirect calls, so it wasn't just returns. Uh, yeah. Don't call that it. <laughs>